on the last All Out show, I discovered that eating avocado toast is a fucking epidemic here in America. According to the last year, it says CNBC said that uh, $900,000 a month was spent on avocado toast in the nation. It's a lot of money. That's damn near That's damn near $12 million a year. Or so, let's say that's like $10 million a year. That's fucking crazy. I refuse to believe that we're doing bad here in America when we're dropping $10 million a year on avocado toast, man. Where the fuck do I live? And Justin Hunt came by to talk about the Nas Kanye West project. One thing that does stand out to me again is, and I, I'm only using Metacritic because it aggregates reviews across platforms. Nas averages a 77. This project got a 59. Out of 100, his average of, is 77? Yeah, that's pretty that's good. Pretty, that's really good. He's been wildly inconsistent throughout his whole career. But the hip-hop, the rhyme schemes and the production have to go hand-in-hand. Hand. So Nas has always been terrible with picking beats for his projects. Sounds like Kanye emailed him those beats, or he emailed Kanye some vocals, and he put them together in the studio. There's no synergy with this Nasir album. I'm not really feeling it. And now here's another episode of the All Out Show. Let me just... Let me just... Let me just clear something up with that old avocado toast. I don't think everybody in America is doing good, but like somebody in America is doing good if they dropping eleven million on fucking avocado toast. We were also talking about women going to the bathroom. What, what was the what was the news story about that? We're gonna talk about women shitting over a Barry White track. What was the news story, John? What was it? Something about going to the bathroom in public. Oh, yeah. And then you asserted that women were tearing at bathrooms. I found that hard to believe because women always deny that. And I still find Oh, it. yeah. I say oh, I was saying that women, I think I think women poop more in public because they're already, they're already in the position. They just fucking, you just let it go. And when I was a bathroom attendant, they used to tear up the fucking, I had to go clean the fucking women's room and they would tear that shit up. We've got uh, fucking animals. Support for your idea here from a couple people. People called. People called up and left voicemails. Mm-hmm. All right, here. Let me duck this a little bit. Let me go ahead and play it for me. Right. Women are nasty and sleep is shit in public. And I swear to God, it is so true. Where I work at, the majority of us are women, and they blow our toilets up all day, every day. It is nasty in our bathroom. So he is absolutely correct in his wordy that, yes, women do take shits out in public more than they do at home. See? One person agreed with me. I don't get in trouble in the office, but I guarantee all those women back there would didn't refute this. They would say, no way. But, I mean, I've got more. Go so- ask him, John. No, I'm not. Go <laughs> ask him. I'm not going to do that. Put your hand on their leg when you're doing it. <laughs> there was a time when I would have. but Anybody else call? Yeah, got a couple of here. All right, let me hear. This is Rob calling from St. Louis. Hey, the women's bathroom is the worst bathroom ever. I'm talking about I used to uh, uh, work at Red Lobster when I was a teenager, and the women's bathroom, I mean, it, had, it was always shit everywhere. They always had, they didn't put their personal shit where it was supposed to go. They hardly ever flushed the toilet. I mean, He's blood talking in about the, the toilet, it, it was fucking yeah. bad. Yeah. <laughs> Chicks are gnarly, dude. They're savages. They are savage. Savages. And they come out with their cute little fucking heels on after they just wrecked some shit. Out here in L.A., there's a lot of, like, the fucking bathrooms that are for fucking everybody and shit. So you'll be sitting there waiting a long-ass time, and then a chick will come out, and you go in there, and you're like, whoa. <laughs> like, whoa. Then there's this nasty thing where my grandma always tells me that women throw, I don't know what culture it is, but they throw, after they wipe themselves, they throw it in the trash instead of the toilet. I think in um, certain places where the plumbing is bad, like when I went to Peru, like they was doing, they had garbage cans for the doo doo paper and the whole, the yeah, it was disgusting. It was, it was not, it was like I, hey man, like the plumbing just couldn't take all the paper. So yeah, I think certain cultures do that shit. Anybody else calling the cosign? Yeah, I got one more. Yeah, I knew it. <laughs> You're wrong. I was yeah, this is Desmond calling from Omaha, Nebraska. Women do take the worst shits, man. Yo, I used to work at this place, and I used to, you know, clean up the shitters and shit. 
Yeah, I'm telling you, women are disgusting in bathrooms. It's like they fucking just pull their pants down and shit wherever they want to. It's fucking amazing, dude. <laughs> I, I would love to. They're doing that bad. hover shit, man. They're doing the hover. They're hovering because they do the hover where they don't sit all the way down. And then they got the high fiber diets. Who's eating all the salads? Who's ordering all the salads? And only one woman had the nerve. Had the nerve in the. The the had the backbone to cop to it, and all the rest was people that had to clean up after the women. Did you know it was all people that had to clean up after them? Here's a water boy in Milwaukee. Water boy, I lost him. Ain't that a bitch? (laughs) Chris. Yeah. What up? What's up? Where you at? I'm in Cincinnati. I want to chime in on this conversation about female shit in the bathroom in public. Go ahead. Man, first of all, I drive a truck, so I see I see it all day, every day, and it's some nasty, nasty-ass bras out there. The women's bathroom, it's a damn shame, and the bras nasty as hell. And they wipe their ass, they take the damn shitty toilet paper, and just throw it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and that's real talk. They make it rain doo paper. That's fucked up. Man, they terrible. All right. Thank you. Right. Once again, You're John, welcome. you don't understand women. You don't understand them. You don't get them. Well, I believe them. They always they always tell me this doesn't happen, or at least they're very clean and that I'm the animal and that they're not really going to the bathroom in public. It's always sort of a, a, a process at home, but I, I'm wrong. That's why they wait so long before they take a dump at their man's crib, because they know they're wrong. All right, we'll end with T in Denver. No hey, more. what's going on? What up, though? What's going on, man? I'm talking about the nasty women bathrooms, man. The women bathroom is worse than the men's bathroom, man. Calling straight out of Denver, man. Hey, and you won't believe the women that work downtown, how they look. They look so beautiful, man. Did you come and see them come out that bathroom? You go clean it behind them. I'm like, man, what, what, what is really going on? <laughs> and it's just nasty, man. Like, yeah. man, it's mad. Make you think, man. You nasty, man. You nasty, granny panty wearing, man. They eating all that fancy food and shit. Taking fancy, man. fancy oh, doodles. Oh man, nasty, man. See, yeah, well, I'm with T. All right, we don't. We, all right, all right, we got a fucking today's show. Let me tell you what we got. We are, we got the guy that won the World Series of Poker. John Sin in studio. This guy's a millionaire. I don't even know how many people sign up for that shit nowadays. Like 20,000, 10,000, thousands of people sign up for that shit, right? It's a lot. You sort of work your way up the the whole cycle. You start your little casino, you keep winning and winning. Chris Moneymaker got everybody on that shit. Everybody, when Chris Moneymaker won that shit, everybody thought they could play some poker. I was, I was, I was in Vegas when that shit happened when it was on TV and I went down there and just got all my money took at poker I was like oh that shit look easy let me go he's winning his ass off let me go try it yo they cleaned me the fuck out and I was like alright let me go let me not fuck with these people <laughs> were you playing Texas Hold'em or what I was playing whatever yeah yeah the fucking whatever was popular I, I was calling people on everything chasing fucking <laughs> inside straights and shit yeah you're right 10,000 people it starts 10 with. fucking thousand people all right. So we got that. Nomar Slevic. News from the fringe. Outworldly encounters. Evidence of UFO sightings and abductions. I want to hear about the abductions. Also, all right. You want to talk to one of your dead relatives? That sounds harsh, but, you know. We're going to have a, a call right now. If you want to talk to one of your uh, dead relatives, we got a fucking psychic medium coming in but we want to like uh we want to get we want to get the callers organized ahead of time so there eight at eight seven four two three three four five you got any questions about someone that passed or if you got someone that's like fucking with you or haunting you i like having the psychics on because like half the people are like this is total bullshit and the other half are fucking all the way in Oh, the people who call in, they are all about it. They believe it like you wouldn't imagine. 
I had a psychic predict a, uh, a pregnancy on me before, and I, I thought that was pretty impressive. It was like, she's going to have a big butt. And I was like, and I was in my head, I was like, he's just saying that because I sound black on the phone. <laughs> Called a psychic? Oh, this yeah, was this for was, the show. This no, this was like fucking. Oh. This was years ago. This was just fucking. Did you call it nine hundred numbers? Fourteen years, fifteen years ago. Damn! Look at all the motherfuckers calling for the fucking psychic. That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, Gives them I, hope. Look at that. We got okay. So we're gonna get your info. We're gonna get your info and then call you call you back later with our psychic. That's not today, y'all. But uh, we do need we we want our callers ahead of time. Next is Nomar Slevic. I want to hear about abductions and the close encounters. Don't go anywhere. It's an all out show. Let's go. You are checking out the all out show with Rude Jude on demand. Security cameras caught a white orb wandering around the gym. There was a. Eight to ten foot, hairy man looking person. If you notice strange lights in the sky over the weekend, you aren't alone. It's time for news from the fringe on the All Out Show. All right, I got author uh, Nomar Slevic. He wrote Otherworldly Encounters, Evidence of UFO Sightings and Abductions. Welcome to the show, Nomar. Yo, what's up, dude? How you doing, man? Fucking good. I thought you were gonna sound like a scientist, but you was like, "Yo, <laughs> no, fuck no, me up." I'm a big, I'm a big dumb dumb chilling. I was actually just watching uh, Lock Up on Netflix, waiting for your boy to call. <laughs> for real. So what got you into? Yeah. What got you into? How do you know so much about UFOs? Well, man, I got into it way back in the day. It was probably like literally 35 years ago. I was four or five years old, and I had a sighting of my own. And uh, it confused me at the time. It looked like a, a, a lightning bolt was stuck in a cloud. It was really weird. And uh, I saw that during the night. And when I got up the next morning, it was still there. And I went and got my dad to look at it. And by the time we got there, it was gone. Uh, but he did proceed to tell me that, you know, the night before it didn't rain. There weren't any thunderstorms, you know, the night before. And... Uh, ever since then, you know, uh, I've really been fascinated with all things, you know, paranormal, extraterrestrial, things like that. But that's that's where it has its roots, that first encounter. Did your dad believe you or he think he was full of shit? Yeah, he thought I was full of shit. Uh, you know, he like he rubbed my hair and was like, yeah, yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You saw a UFO. Sure. sure no, Omar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You uh you dug in you you dug in deep with the abductions. That's that's kind of what fascinates me. What tell me a bit about there's different types of abductions that the, these these UFOs do, huh? Yeah, there there can be. You know, I mean, it's all in what people describe. You know, I uh, I could never claim to be an expert because you I think it's impossible to be an expert in a field that's so vague. You know, there's there's no absolutes in this field. So again, you just have to go by what people tell you. And so there's there's really like two kinds of abductions, if you will. There were there there is this contactee abduction, and then there is just the regular abduction. It's kind of how it's been classified in ufology. And the contactee abduction scenario is typically uh, pleasant and uh, nice in nature. That's the, and, they don't they don't do the butt probe in there. That's <laughs> right, right, right. Going in and the asshole. It, Right. And um, uh, uh, abductees of this nature also claim that the aliens are here to help the Earth and help humanity, things like that. And then on the other side of it is this abduction piece uh, or the, you know, the other movement, the abduction movement, where they're more malevolent in nature, like you were saying, with the ass probes and, you know, shit like that. And um, that they're, you know, observing Earth. Maybe they've already have uh, come into uh, our world, have infiltrated our world and are walking among us, and they're colluding with our government or world's government uh, to, to, you know, abduct us. Maybe they're abducting us to trade for technology, you know, things like that. Do you talk to these people or are these, or are these accounts that you find from books and other, other shit? Uh, both. 
definitely talked to some people who think that they have been abducted. And I'm glad you brought that up about if I talk to them. When I talk to a witness, I, I really like that because sometimes people aren't willing to talk to me. Sometimes uh, an encounter happened decades ago and the person might be deceased now or is unwilling to talk about it. So when I get to talk to somebody in person, you know, I, I can see their body language. I can see it in their eyes, you know, and at the very least, a lot of the times I believe that they believe it. There's some stories that I hear where I'm like, okay, that never fucking happened, you know. Um, but that's actually more rare. And I would say maybe uh, another rarity is like the 10%, another 10% where uh, I, I 100% believe it myself. I'm like, yup, you've, you've experienced extraterrestrial activity of some sort, you know. But again, those are rare too. But when you talk to cops or people in the military, you're really hard pressed not to believe them. You're like these guys are trained observers. Uh, they have everything to lose, you know, credibility, things like that. So it, it's tough not to believe them, you know. There's people in the military that that uh, that you've that you've spoken to that have had dealings with aliens. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's 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 interesting to say the least. And they're they're pretty wild claims too. Like one of these claims happened at Loring Air Force Base which is uh, up in northern Maine. It's really literally in the middle of fucking nowhere. And uh, there was a huge military base that was there, an Air Force base, from 66-ish to 94. No, 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 47 to 94. Sorry about that. And fully operational. And in the mid-60s is when this encounter happened that an air policeman who was doing his patrols saw a UFO hovering just a couple of feet above the runway and he confirmed it with another air policeman who was actually even closer to it and they said that it kind of blurred and then you know ceased to exist like they didn't see it take off or anything then fast forward about 10 years later and over the course of three nights back in october of 1975 uh, a ufo was also seen over the base and this base housed nuclear weapons and that's kind of a running theory on why UFOs may be interested in military bases is because of the nuclear technology. And over the course of three nights, this, this UFO was seen over the base, over the nukes area. It was caught on radar. And the third night, it all culminated uh, to where the UFO was hovering over the one way. Uh, Maine State Police and air policemen all like converged on the area. They're probably 50 yards from this craft at this point. Uh, the the uh, uh, airmen are describing it as having like a lava or liquid flowing all around it, and it was different colors. And then it simply blinked out, and then it was caught on radar over Nova Scotia, which is, you know, hundreds of miles away Damn. at that point. You know, interesting stuff, you know. 888-742-3345, 888-742-3345. And you're dealing, how many people like are, think you're full of shit, and then how many people are like, oh my God, you're right. There's fucking aliens. Uh, I guess it depends on the context. Uh, to answer it just without thinking about it, probably 50-50. But uh, the context, though, is w when I use the term UFO, I don't always mean extraterrestrial craft. Uh, a lot of times, things are seen in the sky that you can't identify. doesn't mean it's not a Chinese lantern, a plane, a helicopter. If you've ever seen a helicopter flying towards you at night, it looks like a ball of light hovering in the sky, you know, until it maybe, maybe finally takes a turn or something like that, you know. Um, so I've seen a lot of UFOs. Tell me about the like Mothman popular. sightings. Yeah. What is this? Uh, the Mothman. So the original Mothman sightings uh, happened in Point Pleasant, West Virginia in 1966 and uh, happened for a 13-month period where numerous people in town we're seeing this tall humanoid figure with wings, and it had glowing red eyes. And there were concurrent sightings of UFO activity, and men in black were in town talking to people, threatening people. And I found the story of Mothman, of a potential Mothman encounter in Maine that happened in 2001. And this guy was walking home one early evening, and he was hearing this chirping, squeaking type sound. And so he was looking down, thinking it was a mouse. He didn't want to step on it. And when he looked down, he saw the shadow go across the pavement, and it was a shadow of something flying above him. So he looked up, 
and he said he saw this, you know, four, four and a half foot humanoid figure with a very large wingspan. And it flew up over his apartment because he was okay. almost home. And it went to this marshy area behind uh, behind where he lived. And then what did he do? Just oh, chill? Man. Well, <laughs> like, he, uh, he, he told sandwich. people about it. And it's not that they didn't believe him, but they were thinking he might have misidentified, uh, you know, something else. Maybe a turkey vulture or sandhill crane. Those are both in the area. And then he saw the creature actually a couple of months later. And it was much farther away this time. Uh, but he heard the chirping, saw the creature. But he also, during this time, was having reoccurring dreams. And he would be on that same spot. And in the dream, he would look up, and there would be a UFO uh, a, a, as big as a house hovering above him. And it would roar to life and then take off. So, you know, as an investigator and a researcher, I asked him point blank, you know, like, do you really think this was a dream or could it have been a memory? And he was like, well, I, I hate to admit, but I really do think it might be a memory, you know? <laughs> he doesn't remember being abducted or anything, but seeing that UFO and seeing that creature, it, it, it feels related to him, and it feels, you know, like a memory, the UFO piece. Pretty yeah. interesting. We got some phone calls. We got Jazzy B in Pennsylvania. Go ahead, Jazzy B. Hey, uh, no more. Question for you. I got three for you, actually. Okay, so one, do you believe in God? Boy, that's a big question, man. I believe in something higher. I I, uh, I I don't claim to be smart enough to know what that is. All right. What's the so, next but, question? So, so uh, okay. So the second question is: Do you smoke pot? Because that <laughs> now listen. If you if you smoke weed, man, that could have a lot of effect on what the fuck's going on in your head. Okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. But you know, I'm the the stories in the book aren't aren't things that I'm I'm making up. I'm talking to people and they're sharing what what they think that they saw could they be smoking marijuana maybe okay okay What's and then uh, here's the question of them all do you like the men in black say that again the movie men in black do i like it you, yeah <laughs> you believe it to be <laughs> true bad, man. i didn't like part three very much but one was pretty good <laughs> oh this guy this guy you know you got to part three to, uh, jesus christ I was listening to an episode. I don't know if they were talking about aliens, but there's some fucking dude on your show, Jude, a few, uh, a few months ago. He, I think he thought there was, like, aliens walking amongst us. Yeah, do you believe that? That aliens walk amongst us? Yes. Uh, I don't know. I um, I certainly think it's possible, but there's a lot of hoops to jump through to get there. Like, first of all, do you believe in... You sound like more of a skeptic than I thought you were going to be. You seem, you, seem, you seem more skeptical of a lot of this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would describe myself as an open-minded skeptic. You know, I want to have credibility with my witnesses. I want to have credibility with people reading the book. And, you know, just because there's a light in the sky doesn't mean it's an alien craft. You know, just because you have a wild thought doesn't mean I have to believe it, you know. So I, I want to hear these stories. How many, and I want to share these stories. How many of the abductions were sexual? And then of those, how many did you believe? <laughs> Uh, the, I only heard of one like sexual portion of an abduction and it was actually the, the guy claimed that a contraption was put over his penis and then like he, it, it like massaged him or whatever. And he came into that and uh, I don't know, this is one of these guys, Did you believe where, it? he seemed, he seemed sincere. So, all right, Danny in Cincinnati, go ahead, Danny. Hey, man, I just wanted to talk about them aliens out in space. Uh, you know, I, I believe in aliens personally. Uh, I ain't never really seen nothing, but I'm one of those conspiracy theorists, at least one that has an open mind, like you say. Uh, and, you know, some of my facts to just throw it out there is, you know, we've never had a successful launch and separation of atoms in space. You know, the aliens, in my opinion, didn't really start showing up again until – we started sending out those pulsars with the, you know, splitting of the atom, which is exactly what, you know, happens on a star or whatever, you know. I don't so even that's know. That's my that personal right. take on it, you know. Is that is does that tie into your nuclear theory, uh, Nomar? Is that what uh, I suppose it could, um, but uh, uh, kind of like you, I don't know a whole lot about that. Dell in California, go ahead, Dell. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to call and say, I mean, right, do we have to throw all common sense out of the window to listen to this? 
I mean, every time we talk about these aliens, they're, they're at a damn Air Force base. You know how many classified aircraft have been in Air Force bases since the 1930s that look like UFOs? I mean, it's kind of common yeah. sense. I mean, it's always at some Air Force base. Duh, it's a damn aircraft that we don't want to talk about. And then the other yeah, thing you're, is, you're, what's with you're, aliens you're coming all the way across the fucking universe to poking people's booties and shit? I mean, you got the power to fly across the damn galaxy to explore human booty holes? I mean, that don't make no sense, man. I mean, I think that's just, that's a stretch. I mean, you got to throw all common sense to even start to believe any of that. Just saying. He does bring up valid points. Yeah, he does. He does. I, I, I couldn't claim to know what they're doing here. Why do they fly all the way over here to look in a booty yeah, hole? Yeah. Why? And, and, and who knows? You know what? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because it ain't aliens. It's, it's Rick and Bob getting high and shit and then fucking poking each other in the booty hole and having a fucking excuse saying it was aliens and shit. How many cats did you talk to that you were like, this motherfucker is a schizo or some shit like that? Oh, jeez. Uh, a bunch. A bunch, yeah. Yeah. P of Minnesota, former former military. Hey, guys, man. The thing about luring is known to be true. And I'll just say this. The United States Air Force and the military, they know they've encountered them. And I was in be pre before the whole Internet shit. And I can just say I was on an air crew and we encountered a UFO. I don't know what it was, but we encountered it and we never admit to it. So whether it's UFOs or not, it's up, people can say what they want. But I know for a fact that we've encountered, I've encountered or been on an aircraft did you, uh, encountered did you guys uh, talk about an uh, airline, I mean a uh, UFO. Did you guys talk about it amongst yourselves when you saw it? Yeah, and you give an official report. I mean, the government knows because you report and you're on the radio. You talk about yep, the shit, yep. and then they tell you don't talk about it. What did yeah, it look I was like? Ask if... It was uh, quickly moving, light, pretty much what everybody sees. Yeah. You know, it kind of hovered yeah. around us, moved around the aircraft as we we're flying. You know, we're doing about 400, 500 knots, you know, their speed, and then, bam, it's gone. Damn. And, you know, I have a, a you know, one of my, my cousin was in the Navy, as well, and he said, you know, the air the pilots would talk about they would see the shit out in the ocean when they're out flying around, you know, doing their little uh, sortie missions for for you know getting their flight times in. So, you know, I'm just saying, I don't know if this shit is real or not, but I know I seen what I seen, and I ain't crazy. And I was in the military, and we couldn't get high, and I surely wasn't drunk because I was flying. So, you know, so you know, people can say what they want, but it's something out there. What do you, you can't just say it's all military aircraft because what well, people don't know a lot of that shit is that certain bases that fly out of so all right, just, thank you p yeah uh xavier you said you were abducted by aliens well i grew up on a military base back in the early 90s and um i would have like weird crazy like dreams as a kid like alien shit and then one dream I had, my ear, like, I told my sister, like, they put something in my ear, and I touched my hand, and it was, like, dry blood in it, and she's flipping out. And then when I got older in my, my 20s, I read a book by William Cooper, Behold the Pell Horse, and he said that the government, United States government, let aliens experiment people on the time I was living there. So it was almost like confirmation. So do you, Interesting, man. Do you, is that, do you remember anything, or is that it? Just I just remember them, like, I mean, I had dreams in Louisiana of the same shit, like, beings and stuff and he said like in military bases the government in the book he said that the government allowed them to experiment on people that live on the bases it's like an agreement they have it's pretty it crazy seemed like a dream and like and it was just i was like flipping out because i was like holy shit i lived there as a kid and i kept having like experiences like that constantly with these these things and i like you know and i always tell my sister my sister kind of didn't believe me so i had the whole blood thing in my ear then she was like holy shit like you could be telling the truth because i was like 10 or 11 like having this thing should, should happen to me but yeah, and then it was like confirmations, like for the, the base that I lived on. He said, "Did you have an exactly uncle sneaking in, in your book. shit or some shit like that?" Or... <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> Just did you have like an uncle sneaking into your room at night or anything like that? And you do no, I was push like, it out of your brain. Well, he's gonna insert shit in my ear. Yeah, who knows what he's uncle. into? No. I don't know. <laughs> No, it wasn't. It wasn't a booty rape alien. It was the ones that just wanted to run tests on me. Maybe because uh, they weren't like pedophile aliens. They just wanted to run tests Word. on me. Yeah, fuck pedophile aliens. That's yeah. bullshit. Yeah, man. <laughs> you gonna wake up with like a melted pops popsicle stick and a, your booty was hurting? 
No, man, but I used to also, at night, I would go out and, like, look out my binoculars and look at stars, and I would see, like, a, the military vehicles, like, out there, and then I'd see, like, other vehicles that would jump from, like, spot to spot, like, in seconds. So Damn. I saw a lot of shit really? when I was, like, growing up on the bases at night. Yeah, and it's tough with military bases, man, because, like, the other caller was saying, like, you never know what's classified or what's not classified or are they in collusion and it is alien, you know, the whole Area 51 thing. Like, who who really knows what's going on? But it sounds like you experienced a lot of shit. Nomar Slevic, the book, Otherworldly Encounters, Evidence of UFO Sightings and Abductions. Uh, thanks for calling up and, and having this alien discussion with us. I feel like I learned yeah, a bit. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on, man. Love the show. Oh, thanks, man. All right, uh, you can find the book everywhere, and it's uh, Otherworldly Encounters. Thanks again, Nomar Slevic. Thanks. Peace. You are checking out the All Out Show with Rude Jude on demand. Shay 45, I'm here with a champion, Johnson, World Series of Poker 2018. How's it going? Fucking awesome, man. <laughs> You're the champ, dude. I am the champ. How many people did you beat out? I think it's about 7,840. That's fucking crazy. It is crazy. How many times have you been in this event? How, how many times have you entered the World Series of Poker? The main event, maybe five times. So you've gotten to the main <clears throat> event five times? Well, the main event, to anyone anyone can enter. They just okay. have to put up uh, the 10,000 buy-in. It costs 10 racks to, to buy in. Mm-hmm. How many of those players are serious players out of the 7,000? Like, how many of them do you really fucking respect? Uh, if you define it by respect, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to how to count that many people, but there's a lot of people that create a lot of content on there that, you know, I, I can't even follow. Yeah. You know, they're, they're so good. And there's a lot of players that have been doing this for a long time, too. So, I mean, the number's high. So it's it's there's some serious players in this shit. There's some serious players, but I mean the reality is there's serious players that you don't even know about too, right? Like serious players that don't don't need the fame or anything like that, but they just come out and and play and play well and you just have no idea who they are. They're probably the most dangerous. They probably are the most dangerous. Now, <clears throat> do you play in a lot of tournaments? Uh Compared to, like, a recreational player, yeah. yes. Compared to, like, a tournament grinder, no. Okay. So people knew people knew about you. You you weren't sneaking up on anybody. People knew about me because two years ago I got 11th in this main event also. That was but a, that was probably the only reason that they would know about me. How much money you went on that one? 650. That's pretty fucking good, dude. Yeah, at the time that was easily my biggest score. Did you go on to do you play cash games as well? I do. Uh, generally play cash games. What do you prefer? You know, to make money, cash games is a little bit easier. Uh, there's so much variance in tournaments, and you just never know when you're going to hit a big score or not hit a big score. But on the other side, there's no feeling like going deep in a tournament. Yeah. You know, you can't get that in a cash game. It, does your does a, How much does your strategy change between cash game and uh, in a tournament? Um, a pretty decent amount, but the main event is the tournament that's most like a cash game. Okay. So I have to adjust the least, but tournaments are interesting because, uh, you know, at every stage in the tournament, like everything is different. Whereas like a cash game, it's, you know, you, you run into the same situations over and over again. 888-742-3345. We have the world series of poker champion, John Sin and this bitch. You was, what, what, what were you doing before you started playing poker? Well, I learned poker in high school, but before I went, before I quit my job, my last job was out an IT consultant. You was one of the math, you, you was like a math dude. Kind of studied finance. Go with numbers. Yeah. Is that the, is that, what, what, what are the, what are the most important skills to be good at poker? You know, I think uh, when you break it down into like big skills, the, the two are the math and the other one's like the psychology how so explain the psychology you know psychology being able to pick up on patterns of other people um uh, being able to uh you know there there's you know in, in any given hand the math is important but when you start talking about like the meta game like the the long-term play you know this guy never bluffs is he gonna bluff now like right. that sort of thing um so that becomes important too D- has, does that help you read people in real life 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's, you know, I've developed some sort of instinct where like I can't really articulate it sometimes, but I just know when people are, you know, full of it. <laughs> full of shit. Yeah. yeah. That's why I'm really bad at poker. I'm really Excuse bad. Excuse language full of shit. Yeah, you, you can cuss on here, man. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah. That dude over there behind, he got kicked in the nuts a gang of times, like last week. On the show? Yeah, yeah. There was, like, there was dicks out and everything. Like, you can oh. like, unwind. You're good. <laughs> I feel, like, feel like you're crossing saying, some sort of line there. I don't I'm not know saying which take line. your dick out. I don't need to see yeah. your dick. <laughs> John. Uh, that's crazy. There's two Johns in the studio, a loser John and a winner John. Oh, it's very interesting. <laughs> Both ends of the spectrum. It's, it's fucking, it's there. Yeah, it's like the alpha and the omega cancel each other out fucking the winner and then the wah, wah, wah. john this john is worth like 10 million dollars and you're worth like 10 cents i mean i was i was the other john until a couple weeks ago you see that he was dead broke really yeah I, I this is the first tournament i've ever won no kidding yeah the, the, like mm -hmm. if you looked at my results i don't think i ever finished better than like sixth or fifth in a tournament before that's what, what was the what was the hand you won with on this one King Jack of Clubs. What was the flop? Flopped King King oh. Five. Damn. Yeah, it was. I was loving life. Damn. It was pretty oh, pretty good flop. Yeah. All right. Let's hear. Let's hear the call. That's the call, and that is the tournament. John Sin can now call himself main event champion. You got a girlfriend? Uh, I do not. Well, this is going to be a good question for you then. Let's go to Annabelle in Charleston. Oh, hi there, John. I wanted to know if uh, a poker groupie has ever robbed you. Has ever robbed me? You've been robbed by a yeah. poker groupie. By a poker groupie. I don't know. Definitely not by a poker groupie. I've only been robbed once, and I I had left my car unlocked, and they took everything, including the, the trash that was in the car. But that that was about it. Was that at a poker game, or you was just parked? no? I was oh. just parked. I was just parked somewhere. I, I don't think I've been robbed related to poker. Okay. Hopefully that doesn't happen. How much? How much is? What's the most you won in like a cash game hand? In a cash game hand, um, probably five figures. But, no shit. Yeah, but not definitely nothing six figures. Are you playing with bankers and mafia guys? <laughs> uh, not that I know of. Bankers, maybe. Um, you know, just. Entrepreneurs, business people. Nobody is doing like fucking like like people aren't. No one's got like like guns insurance out scams like or no shit like that. They're fucking not that I know. Of. All right, you, you need insurance? Nah, you no, know, I'm just okay. Actually, dude, you got to hook up on life insurance. <laughs> Lee in Chicago. Hey, what's going on, John? Uh, quick question: What do you think about bluffing when people bluff? And then they, they win the hand off of bluffing. They get called donkeys. But that's part of the game. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, absolutely part of the game. I love bluffing. You know, bluffing is just something that comes down to how often do you do it. If you do it too much, then people think you're bluffing all the time. If you don't do it enough, then people just think you have the best hand all the time. So if you can bluff an amount where people don't know and you keep them off your toes, I think that's like, you know, that's a beautiful part of the game. What is that, like one What's to five? Uh, you know, I mean, it, it also depends on your opponent too. Right. Like if your opponent is the type to never call a big bet, then you, then you really can just bluff him over and over again. Or if your opponent is the type to never fold, then you can just, you know, never bluff and it's okay. Well, you, what's the worst hand that you've bluffed with? Sorry, Drew. Yeah. What's the worst hand that I bluff with? Um, yeah. I remember one time a few years ago, we were playing the seven deuce game. I don't know if you know that, but basically if you win oh, yeah, a pot, yeah, yeah. yeah, if you win a pot with seven deuce uh, which is the worst hand in poker, Yeah, uh, you win extra money. And so I, I bet some guy raised me. No, some guy I bet I raised him, he raised me, and I raised him again, and then he just called, and then the flop came like A7 deuce. So I, You won with two pairs. Yeah, I, I ended up winning a lot of money in that hand. So I don't know if I'd call that a bluff, but when I was putting the money in, I had I had nothing. So You had nothing. Yeah. How and then last question. Sorry, God uh, damn! The, since you in a WSOP, is everything is televised. So how does that affect your strategy moving on? Like, it, does it change your game? Like the next tournament, you went from eleven to number one. 
did you have to change your game? Because every they know your moves and your patterns and stuff like that. That was a better question. Kind of <laughs> that was a much better question. Uh, yeah, no, this is, a, this is a good question. Yeah. When I got 11th, I thought that I might have to change my game some and that people would know and pick up. But I didn't get that much airtime. But I have heard from people that, like, you know, people who have won it in the past just can't figure it out. They're like, something's happening. People are playing differently against me, and I can't figure it out. And they can't win for a period of time. Um, but I'm I'm pretty excited about that. I think that like just adds another dimension to poker. It's gonna make it more challenging. So yeah. like I can't wait for my next big field tournament. Are you the type of person that rocks the fucking headphones and sunglasses and shit like that? No, nah, no, nah, I'm pretty like I, I was wearing a hoodie, which is kind of common, I guess. But I'm not. I don't have the hoodie up or anything like that. I like to be open. You know, have fun at the table. I'm not trying to you know intimidate anyone or anything like that. Let's see. Let's see that you brought the bracelet. I did bring the bracelet. They get, if you when you win it, they give you a big ass bracelet. Let's see it. All right. Are you ready for it? Yeah. God damn. Yo, bro. <laughs> Is that a real react? It That's looks like reaction. it looks like they just called up a pimp and asked them to design a fucking bracelet. <laughs> <laughs> like if if a pimp was a wrestler, like if it was a, if it was a pimp met a world wrestler and they had to make a. a bracelet baby it would be this this shit Bell is buckle. this shit is a iced out how many carrots is on this bitch dog that that i don't know that's fucking crazy and it's got rubies all over it. this is beautiful congratulations man that's motherfucker thank you not too many not too many people have those uh, who do you think now that you now that you you've won do you consider yourself one of the best players Mm, no. Who do you think who 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 is who are some of the best players in in your opinion? I mean, when you talk about best players, there's different you know players for different games, right? If you ask me, tournament Bonimo is having like the the most incredible year. Like, yeah, I think halfway through the year he was having a better year than anyone had in a full year span. Um, if you're talking cash games, I, I had a guy Jungle Man on my rail. You know, people consider him some of the best in the, in some of the heads up games. No shit. Know? Yeah. Do y'all just always play uh, the no the the Texas 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 Hold'em, or do you play different different games? Um, play different games. You know, Omaha is something that's popular right now, uh, and I've always enjoyed playing a lot of the other games. So I'm just not very good at them. Okay. Uh, whereas you know, I do feel pretty confident in my No Limit game. Let's go to Tim in Virginia. Tim. John, how you doing? Hey, what's going on, Tim? Hey, uh, quick question for you. I know I, I'm kind of an advanced poker player, and I don't see it as a slow roll, but do you kind of want to kind of go over what your mentality was on that last hand and what took you so long to act? Uh, sure, I can do that. Um, yeah, there has been a little bit of controversy, but I think most people uh, are, are in agreement that it's not a slow roll. But Wait, what happened? Because so, not everybody saw, so break it down. Right, so I flopped trips, which is you know one of the best flops I could hope for. Um, and then on the turn, and he bet, and I called on the flop. The turn came at eight, uh, completing no draws, putting more draws out there. Uh, and he went all in on me. Uh, and I took, I think the whole hand was about three minutes. So, you know, some what, some of the things that are going through my mind are, uh, he had bluffed a huge hand earlier in the tournament. And uh, with the delay, like, you know, we found out later, oh, that guy was bluffing. Uh, and I and I actually tanked that hand with a really bad hand. And I was like, okay, I don't think he's going to bluff me again because uh, he saw me thinking about it with a really bad hand. Uh, so that went through my head. And so I was like, uh, um, and then I asked for a chip count to see, you know, if I make this call, am I still alive or am I dead? Um, and at that point, I was like, okay, I'm taking a little bit of time here. I want to... You know, I want to make sure he knows that I'm not slow rolling him. So I said, I'm not slow rolling you. I, like, I don't have ace-king. I don't have king-queen. And I was about to say, but I have king-jack. And then I thought, this might be against the rules. Right. And I don't want to break yeah. any rules during yeah, yeah. The, the biggest hand of my life. So I asked Jack, I was like, can I say my hand? Like, is that okay? Um, and so that took a little bit of time, too. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, a few of those things. Is that a faux pas or some shit? You know, a uh, slow roll is has like the insinuation that 
there's some malintent. Like you're waiting a guy out with the best hand to make him feel like they have the best hand, but really you. Yeah, have it's something you do to your buddies all the time. Sure, you know, like if I was playing in a low stakes, you know, stupid game, I, I might, you know, I might rub it in the guy's face and slow roll or something like that, but. Uh, it was never my intent. To it's like flipping the bat in baseball or some shit like yeah, that. Yeah, somebody somebody's compared it to that. Or like hanging on the rim and letting your nuts hang in your <laughs> face after you dunk on somebody. Uh, somewhat like that. All right, people. Um, people got actually. Oh, uh, people and, actually got questions. Yeah. And it's just a it's just a three point five million dollar decision. You know, I'm just I'm just not gonna <laughs> I'm just not gonna snap a, a, a three and a half million. You eat Xanax decision. or anything? Do I do Xanax? Yeah, like you uh, to, tried, to, to like chill the fuck before. out in the games. No, I, that it passes me out. Do you, or or I black out. Do you so do I Adderall stop. or are you just totally sober for the shit? Um, I do Adderall sometimes. I was gonna say because you, you play for what hours and hours straight. Yeah. Uh, I think it was about ten or eleven yeah. hours. Do you, do you, well, and it, and it's not straight either. Uh, it's you know every commercial break we weren't playing, and then there's like structured breaks. Uh, and you know, I also have the advantage of having made two deeper runs in the main event. So I'm a lot more prepared. And then a lot of games that I play back here, you know, they're like kind of party games and we just like play until like late in the morning and, you know, just having fun. So I'm kind of prepared for like a long, yeah, a longer session. I play backgammon and after like a couple hours, I'm fucking, I feel, I feel so fucking stupid. dude. (laughs) Like, I'm like, I gotta walk away from this. I'm making dumb mistakes. Uh, JJ in Charlotte. Hey, man, question for you. So I've been playing one two cash game basically my whole life. Recently graduated uh, to the big two five game. Um, obviously playing a lot tougher opponents now. Um, you know, and, and I'm having problems with reading guys. Like you can't get good reads off the better players. Is there any, I don't know, books or blogs or blogs that you recommend me uh, checking out? When it comes to reading people, um, I'm not sure. You know, that's that's something that, you know, if you want to move up in stakes, people are just going to get better and better at. And your advantage at that point is going to be knowing the math better and better. Um, and then, you know, more than reads, uh, you should also, I would say, uh, trying to find patterns, you know, um, not necessarily like if somebody does some sort of, you know, make some sort of move when they're bluffing or something like that, but more like, okay, kind of like the, the bluffing thing we were talking about earlier. How often is this guy bluffing? And if he's bluffing a lot, then how, like, how loosely should I be calling him? You know, stuff like that. Uh, I do I do have a subscription to run it once, and, and I find some of the material on there is good. But, uh, I mean, no matter where you go, you kind of just have to filter out you know, the videos and see what works well for you. I think that's the most important thing. All right, we got John Sen here. He's a 2018 World Series of Poker champion. We're going to take some more calls, but first, uh, here's a little Trigger the Gambler. This is the closest thing I could get to the gambler for you. <laughs> this Trigger the Gambler. My crew can't go for that. 888-742-3345. I got my man John Sen here. He fucking won the World Series of Poker. Still weird to hear that. You did? Have you bought anything stupid yet? You got? Are you gonna go like? Are you gonna? Are you gonna? Are you gonna? There's. I don't. I don't think I've bought anything stupid yet. Do I you mean, want to? Like, I mean, at some point, I got to do something stupid. Yeah, with right. My money. Yeah. You seem sensible, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, like when I got eleventh, um, I won all this money and and f- fucked it all up and. You know, so I, I'm trying to be more careful this time around. How'd you fuck it up? You know, just, you know, a lot of bad choices, bad investments. Uh, I was playing way bigger than I should be playing uh, yeah. with my bankroll. You know, stuff like that, just taking shots. I mean, there's definitely, like, a DJ inside of me that wants to, like, gamble and, you know, take yeah. some shots for sure. Is it like uh, it's just never enough? Does Is it like an addict where, like, you got to bet more and more for it to, to feel the rush? Do you need the rush? Um, you know, poker is different than like regular gambling, right? So like, you know, if I like pit, play in the pits or bet sports, like I, I, I do love the rush. Uh, so I try not to do it. Um, but as far as like my poker mentality goes, like, I, you know, I, I'm playing poker. I have, you know, I, I have some tolerance to risk and variance. So if there's like a really good game, but it's like a big portion of my bankroll, like it, I can't help but want to take a shot. There you go. But then I've, you know, I haven't been like invited to any like million dollar games or anything like that. So 
hopefully it hopefully that doesn't happen. Hopefully I'm not <laughs> presented with these opportunities. Let's go to Patty P in Connecticut. Patty P. Hey John. Congratulations on the win, man. I just I was wondering I played some poker myself and I know everybody's been on tilt at least once. Let's hear a story about when you were on tilt and how you lost a fuck ton of money or something. Oh man, I actually used to have a pretty big tilt problem. Um the last time it happened and I lost a lot of money, I'm not really sure. Uh but what what's on tilt mean? Like that's tilt tilt means, you know, something doesn't go your way. And so you just, you know, your shit. Yeah, you know, you develop this mentality that like poker owes you something <laughs> and like that you deserve to win. And so you just kind of go crazy and then you realize, oh, no, poker doesn't owe you anything. You can just keep losing money and, you know, it might not. It, it, and you can just never win again. Like, that's just possible. Do you, um, is there other hands where you like you had the best hand and then you got out flopped and it just lives with you for fucking it? Or do you for, it or, used to, but not anymore, you know? Uh, part of what I attribute to being able to win the main event is, you know, having a mentality of like, you know, everything's all good. It doesn't matter what happens as long as like, you know, you can you can control certain things and those things that you control. Like if you do it well, like the results doesn't matter. You just got to enjoy the journey. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's very Zen of you. Yeah. And it, it's it's kind of ironic that, you know, someone who won the main event would be saying this, but yeah. <laughs> I do I do attribute the win to that mentality. Like I was in 12th place and I was like joking around with some friends like I could get knocked out 12th right, right here. And, you know, uh, they're like, shut the fuck up. Like, what, why would you say that? <laughs> but the, in my mind, you know, I was half joking because I knew it, it would uh, it would bother them. But in my mind, I knew if I got knocked out 12th, everything would be good. And, you know. I was never worried about that. As long as I played well, that's all that matters. Cabby Jimmy. Cabby Jimmy. Hey, JC, man, you did very well. This is Cabby Jimmy out of Indianapolis, Indiana. I don't know if you remember me or not, John. Jimmy? Oh, my God. Out of KFC. We played KFC. We played a long time ago with Bob and everybody else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, what's and, going, uh, man? Actually... I just text Bob. I was telling him that I was waiting online to speak to you and shit. You know what I'm saying? We all say congratulations to you from KFC and all that. You understand? Kev, you used to play with him? Thank you. That's got to be cool. Uh Yes. You used to play with him? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's cool, Yeah, we used to play together. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And congratulations again, brother. We're very proud of you. You represented very well. You was well behaved and all that. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate that. Let's go to Mike in New York. Mike, go ahead. Um, Hey, John. I want to know if you got any uh, superstitions, any sort of uh, lucky pair of socks that you wear. Are you uh, superstitious at all? You know, I I think uh, as a someone who plays professionally or or has played professionally, I kind of have to train myself to not be superstitious. But I do very much believe in like the the power of positivity. So uh, and that can and some of that you know crosses lines with superstition. So like if you watched me on ESPN, I was wearing the same hoodie every day. And obviously, you know, clothes get dirty. I was wearing the same jeans every day. And, you know, part of that was, um, you know, I just want to make sure I'm comfortable, not have to make any, you know, decisions, like think about what I want to wear. Uh, but I mean, a part of that was like, hey, man, the hoodie and jeans are working. <laughs> don't fuck it you up. Don't don't change it. Yeah. You know. And uh, last last call we can take is uh, Jake in D.C. Jake. Hey, guys. Um, so. Long-time poker player, uh, used to be able to play online with Full Tilt. Uh, question is, is there any uh, websites online in the U.S. that you can play either cash or tournament? And then two, uh, for all the guys that are in these tournaments that are like $10,000 or even like the one-drop million dollar, like do they have sponsors that back them? And then if they do win, they give a portion of the winning back? Thanks. Um, I'm not too familiar with the online scene. I know there's some like uh, agent-ran sites that are uh, – blowing up around LA and I'm sure other places uh, but I don't know if uh, what's legal what's not and I don't really play online that much um, and as far as the big buy-ins go I do know you know there's a lot of deals being made you know people take pieces of each other people sell pieces and you know so and some of it, that information is public like Fedor Holtz uh, I think for the one drop sold like 20% of himself to the general public you know no uh, shit yeah I don't know for what reason uh, or what intensive but yeah people uh, people sell that markup and you know sometimes they might not have to put a dollar into the tournament there you go uh, yo Johnson congratulations on fucking winning the World Series of Poker. Thank you are you. the champion, sir. Thanks, dude. If I had the We Are the Champions song, <laughs> I'll play that for you right now. Let's see if I got it. We'll 
pull it up and fucking talk you out. No. Oh, wait, I misspelled queen. Put too many E's in that bitch. Here we go. This is you fucking, you did it. John, you won. <laughs> there were 7,000 people. You fucked them all up, John. Wow, this is like one of the first times it's like kind of hitting me. You know, got the music and yeah, you, narrating. Yeah. I've just been so busy, like, you know. Everybody had cards, but your cards were better. Played your cards right. Now you're the fucking champion. You could fuck tons of chicks, but pull out because you don't you have to give up child support. But you can, yeah. But, I you, yeah, I got you. But you can buy the morning after pill. You can afford that shit. Get you a new car. What kind of car you got right now? Camry, 2007. <laughs> Bumpers <laughs> off, dents in the car. I yeah. love it. My man, fucking millionaire with a Camry. <laughs> That's, I love it. Johnson, thanks for talking with us, sprinkling the game, and uh, congratulations on your win. Thank you. Let's go. You are checking out the All Out Show with Rude Jude on demand. Hey. How you doing out there? How you, how you guys doing out there? Good so far? Great. Glad to hear it. You want to go see Wiz Khalifa and Friends? <laughs> uh, you'll be playing in Austin, Texas. We will fly you and a friend to Austin, Texas. Put you up for the night. You get to meet Wiz Khalifa and Ray Schremer. Ray Doing a big concert. It's going to be fucking awesome. Go to the show. Fucking chill in Austin. It's a good scene down there. Maybe they'll even put you up in the W. I don't know that. Don't quote me. I'm just throwing out names. It's not going to be the Hojo. <laughs> That's what they put me last, in the south by, last South by Southwest. It was disgusting. I wouldn't take my shoes off in that bitch. I know. I took my shoes off. The carpet was sticky. I was like, oh, man. How many... How many buckets of cum has been dumped <laughs> in here? Yeah. That went left. Um, you guys should go go to Sirius.com forward slash Wiz Khalifa to... To enter to win that contest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, go to Sirius.com forward slash uh, on demand. If you want to listen to any of this show on demand. Talk to the UFO guy. Poker dude. And you can hear John doing the news on demand. He's always fucking great at it. So <laughs> That's actually coming up next. Don't go anywhere. You are checking out the All Out Show with Rude Jude on demand. And now, it's time for News from the Chin with John C. Matthews. Got a list of seven sexual health myths. 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 People believe these things about sex. Not true. N not true. John's going to debunk. Everything you thought you knew about sex. Breaking things down. All right, here's one. You can get an STI from a toilet seat. Who says that? Idiots. I don't know. I've never heard that. I've never heard that. Well, some believe it. Maybe the kids. STI from a toilet seat? While contact with infected skin could lead to an STI transmission, contact with a toilet seat will not. That's because the pathogens cannot live outside of the human body for long. So you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, that's why when I shit, I don't even put the fucking. I wipe it down, but I don't even. I don't even put a paper towel down, cause I'm. I'm a savage. Don't give you, a ever fuck, use, son. you ever use those liners that even like, we have? That shit is it's no, ridiculous. It's like, come on, man. Like, who we who we kidding? Yeah, but they piss all over the seats. It's gross. I what I go in there. I go in there. I got a wet paper towel and a dry paper towel, and I wipe it with a wet paper towel, and then I clean it with the dry paper towel. I feel much better about that than some thin ass fucking. You think that little thin ass half a 
half of thick. It's it's half the thickness of a regular piece of paper. You think that's gonna keep pee from your butt? I put like four. You put so you got like a nest after I've been I, in there. You what? It's a good idea after I've been in there. Ugh. You let loose, huh? <laughs> you let loose. <laughs> I don't know. I just figure all the grimy shit I do is like, fuck it. I used to not be able to even go to the bathroom in public. No. After a while, I was like, fuck it. It's going to happen. Another one, you cannot get an STI from oral sex. Of course you can. I don't know. I didn't think you could. And then I, I'm t- tired of telling the strep dick story, but yeah, I got strep dick. Yeah. Many STIs, including syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, chlamydia, can be spread through oral. So you got to wear a condom or use the, the dental dam. Or just fucking risk it. <laughs> Or just fucking risk it, man. When was the last time you had a a condition? Years. Mm. I think probably like fourteen years ago. That long ago? Yeah, man. Four. Oh, okay. I'm t- yo. I'm not even gonna like. I know it sounds fucked up, but like back when I was living back in Michigan, and I was fucking with like chicks in my neighborhood and stuff like that it was I was getting it a little bit more than than usual and uh I was going raw all the fucking time and then I told you the story they sat cause I kept going to the same free clinic clinic and uh they were like like they had my chart you know they're like dude like what the fuck are you doing you're gonna you're gonna scar your urethra so like chill out and then and I started rocking condoms and then uh started fucking rich chicks. <laughs> rich people don't get diseases. Yeah. <laughs> Another myth, anal sex causes hemorrhoids. Not true. Hemorrhoids are a result of increased pressure in the veins of the anus, and the pressure causes these veins to swell, making them painful, especially when you're seated. But anal sex, as long as you take your time and make sure your your ass is fully relaxed, you're you're good to go. There you go, ladies and gentlemen, if you're into that shit. All right, I, I'm not. I don't have anything to say on that. I'm a hemorrhoid survivor, and yeah. I just that shit's hereditary, dude. It fucking sucks. And of course, don't strain while you're taking a shit. That's, that's why, yo, bro. Like that. That's why they the squatty potty talks about like all these third world countries. Cats don't have hemorrhoids because they shit in holes. They're squatting. They're in the natural position. It's an unnatural position where we're in, and it causes motherfuckers to strain, and then they push, and there's more hemorrhoids happening in fucking first world countries. Yup. Be careful. Um, I mean, like, real talk, like, that's how you're supposed to have a kid, too. Like, squat that fucking baby out. Really? Yeah, this whole lying on the bed, that's that's for the doctor. That's for the ease of the doctor. But again, these are smart people who've been looking at this for... I trust that. <laughs> I trust doctors. You have to trust someone. Yeah, that's no, right. I'm sorry, you do. I know, but th- what, does, wouldn't it make more sense for the woman to be squatting and allow gravity to help the baby come out sure the weight of the baby would help push the baby out of the birth canal I'm just saying like did you do that with your daughter I didn't even know if it was going to be my kid no. until like <laughs> I didn't have a fucking ton to say on, on the way it was, I, I was there for her birth you were you in the delivery room yeah yeah I was there wow and they did the cut thing and oh. I oh and I fucking almost fainted. I was like, whoa. I had to go outside for a second. I came back and then to see if see what color uh, the color the kid was going to come out. She came out mixed. I was like, all right, I'm probably the dad. Was that a episiotomy or something like that where they ripped the vagina? I didn't ask. Oh. <laughs> Ugh. They squat now, and they squat now, and uh, in 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 a lot of hospitals, and they got special handles. So there you go. Right. Boom. Also, another myth, you cannot get pregnant during menstruation. You can. And, of course. Really? It's, 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 well, they're saying here, 
while conception is unlikely during menstruation, it's not impossible. But I want to be. Yeah, I be none in these bitches. Strawberry shortcake. Making strawberry yogurt. Mix it up with a spoon. That's the only good part of period sex is you can go raw. Well, they're saying your chances are highest during ovulation, uh, and that's when the the uh, during the menstrual cycle where the eggs take, how sway take, takes a, a trip from the uh, doesn't matter. But at any rate, um, but the problem is the sperm can live on for a week inside your body. So the combination of an egg Damn. and sperm hanging around together, you could. So you got to catch them at the beginning of the menstrual cycle. That's that's you got to have awful luck, like everything has to go wrong for you. <laughs> like you got to you got to bang on the very last day, and then she's got to fucking ovulate a little bit sooner than usual. Like you, like fuck me, son. Can happen. I know. I'm sure it can happen, but you really bum me out when you say that. Sorry. So. Sometimes the truth hurts. All right, what else? Quickly, uh, douching after sex cleans the vagina, prevents pregnancy. Obviously, don't believe that shit. I can't believe these douches are still around. I mean, every several months. I know, dog. It like, seems like we talk about douches. I know it's crazy. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why either. Is anyone using a douche? I don't. I don't know, bro. I don't know. I've heard. It robs the body of its natural juices. Correct. I've been I've been speaking out against douching. <laughs> I'm anti douche. I want a moist vagina. Moist. All right, what else? A couple left. Uh mas- yeah, so hurry. Ma- masturbation makes achieving orgasm more difficult. Not the case. I don't know, dude. Well, they're saying here, of course, using an intense vibrator six times a day every day might lead to some numbness, but otherwise you you're not in any I don't know, bro. Like it's it's harder for me to pop a second time. So if I jerk off and then have a girl come through, like it's gonna be harder for me to bust. Absolutely. So that's a stupid. That's dumb. Well, stupid, stupid, stupid. <laughs> right. okay, the Maybe fi- for women. I don't know. What else? Finally, vaginas are tight or loose depending on the amount of sex a woman has had. Not the case. I yeah. There's and. We were just, they were just, uh, we just had that porn chick on. I forgot her name. And uh, they were like, isn't your pussy like blew out? Like some of the tightest vaginas I've felt have been on porn chicks that take monster dicks. Mm. So it's an amazing elastic thing down there. <laughs> the elasticity. The last elasticity. The elasticness. The vagina is a muscle, much like an elastic band that has the ability to expand and contract. So yeah, it's going to return. Yeah, bounce back. All right, it looks like drunk America got a big dick. Next day, it bounced back. <laughs> looks like drunk Americans spend a total of thirty billion dollars online each year. When I'm fucking high, there's. I bought some Versace glasses the other the other week. <laughs> How much? For too much. They were like, they, they were like, they were they were like the Biggie Biggie era, like just kind of wire and plastic with gold and shit all over them, and the Medusa heads, and it was a lot. And then when they came to the crib, they're tiny. <laughs> <laughs> they're even small on women. Like I've been trying to give them to like the women I know. I'm like, here, you need some fucking dope Versaces and. Like, can't you send him back? What, what am I gonna say? Hey, I was fucking fucked up when I made this major purchase. That like, I'm not that guy. Like, I, I, I like, I'm just not that dude. It said the size clearly on there. Like, when you're making purchases, like, and they tell you what the fuck it is, or it's up to you to ask what are the size. Some people are like fuck that. I'll take it back. Well, you're well. Me and you are different. And they're saying here what people are drinking when they're making these purchases has an impact. So it looks like gin drinkers 
tended to splurge the most, spending an average of more than 82 bucks. Whiskey drinkers, the most frugal group when classified by type of alcohol, wound up spending 40 bucks. Uh, and people drinking red or white wine spend about 42 to 46 bucks, respectively. Damn, there's a big jump in gin, huh? I can, gin is like double. If I go too far. That's you. It screws me up. I, I've had some adventures on the LA streets a couple of nights. <laughs> Just from the gin, huh? Yeah. And then they gave me some shots of tequila. And I mean, I've fallen off a bar stool. I wound <laughs> up in a bush, lost my clat. Everybody, boss is listening. These are very infrequent. But it's I'm like 47, <laughs> dude. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> You're fucking old as shit. <laughs> Those are very rare things. But I can say, yeah, if you don't, you got to gotta watch the gin. Yeah. Watch out for that shit. I'm going to say that. Yeah, that Jeezy. I buy a lot of shit off of eBay on that shit. These glasses I'm wearing right now, I I got high and bought them bitches. At the time you're doing that, don't you think, okay, wait a minute. Okay, you already have 40 fucking pairs of glasses? I, yeah, I do. And I'm like, ah, fuck it. Yeah, these are dope. I got 40, but I don't got these. <laughs> All right, what else? Coke, cocaine use is on the rise in richer homes over in England and Wales. Rich yeah. people are... Rich people do coke, man. That's I learned that lesson when I moved out here. Are they addicts or they just they, they can handle it? I've always figured I'd just get swept up in drugs like that and just get plowed I don't it. know, man. They just fucking do it and drink a lot and then talk and make plans. <laughs> and get excited about ideas. Oh, actually, just all the all of the rich people I know just do tons of drugs. They're either coke or weed or fucking some type of opiates. They're all in these weird high pressure jobs where they need to fucking relax. Are we talking the weekends, or they get home at night and just get the eight ball, or what? Some of that's just daily. It's just da- yeah, man, they be going hard on a motherfucker. I know. I know. Yep, Coke is the rich. It's all them lawyers and shit, them stock trading motherfuckers, all them shits. Makes you feel powerful. Top of the world. And they're saying here the rise in popularity of cocaine has uh, come at the time that it increased in its purity. So people are thinking that this is better than it has been. Yeah. And then back in the day, there was like a stigma because it was attached to crack and shit. But there's still a stigma, isn't there? Or am I... No? I don't know. <laughs> less of one. I think it's less. I think it's less. Did you find that thing about the straws? Well, what happened with that shit? The L.A. or the California city and the straws? I don't have that yet. You didn't find it? I did not find it yet. Did you look? That has not happened yet. You didn't? God damn it, John. <laughs> God. Well, I didn't know we were going to do that right now. I well, honestly well, didn't. All right, give me another fucking story then, bro. All right. Despite more screen time, technology isn't turning kids into zombies, according to uh, this study here. There's this idea, of course, that uh, kids are getting screwed up with their screens, but apparently they're learning to multitask. And they're coping with it. They're watching maybe TV on their phones, things like that, not just sort of zoning out and turning into zombies, as they put it here. I don't know if a zombie is, would be the thing. Uh, to me, it's almost like ADD, where zombie, it's almost the opposite of zombies, where they need a ton of stimulation, and they can't just sit still. They need something going on in, for, for them all the fucking time, constantly switching and shit. Everything speed. I feel like every generation it speeds up, and more and more information gets shot at you. Like I remember, like looking at my nanny Nuno had a cable, and we was like watching MTV or some shit. And my grandfather was like, "I can't, I can't even keep up with this shit. I'm getting a headache." But he said it. it was like, "What the fuck?" Like he said it was the Italian <laughs> accent. It's like, "What the fuck is this shit? I'm getting a fucking headache." So it looks like some places throughout the country are, are looking at banning straws. San Francisco, shockingly, among them. There you go, San Fran. We got people shitting on the sidewalk. What are we going to do? Let's ban straws. 
That ought to fix it. What's going to happen if they catch you with a straw? You get a fine or some shit? Well, I mean, of course. That, that's how these, these rules work. But they're... Santa Barbara, okay, jail time for straw ban. Jail time. Do you understand? Like, you can straight up know that you have AIDS and give somebody AIDS in California, and that's like a misdemeanor. And they talking about jail time for straws? Where the fuck do I live, bro? What the fuck? What planet am What planet am I on? They trying to get me to leave California. I swear to God, they out there fucking mine. The Santa Barbara ordinance makes it illegal for businesses to hand out plastic straws, and they're also forbidden from handing out plastic cutlery and things like that. So I guess if you're out there holding to your straws, those people will get into some trouble. I looked this shit up. Sixty percent of the fucking plastic waste comes from five Asian countries it's like China Vietnam some other shit I don't got it memorized but I looked it up like calm down San Francisco and it looks like Seattle became the first major city in the US to enact a plastic straw ban earlier this year San Luis Obispo Malibu Santa Cruz and San Francisco have also versions of this whatever they'll just go to paper straws I guess which aren't as good for doing coke it gets all gooky, goo- goopy. <laughs> gets all goopy. And then they get the paper straws get soggy. So they'll have straws. It'll just be paper. Is that it? That's the idea. Yeah. All right, dude. Whatever, man. Whatever. Wh- whatever. I don't have to think. I mean, I've heard that. So stupid. You could probably have some straws on hand if somebody has some sort of disability and they, they need, need to drink from there. It's the hubris that we just, uh, we're changing the world. You got to start somewhere. It's a stupid place to start. Can't you just see it on a certain level? Like, dumb well, fucking place to start. It's mas- It's like masturbating. Like, it's just, it's just jerking yourself off. It's not realistic. <laughs> Want some good news? Yeah, fuck yeah. And now, time for good news. All right. This grocery store employee over in Baton Rouge, she gained some attention because he allowed or asked this kid with... Uh, autism. He's on the spectrum. Uh, help him stock some shelves. And then the dad was filming it, and then a family member posted it and it gained a lot of attention. So, I mean, so, the, the kid's damaged. And then so the... So the kid had au- the kid was autistic, and he, he was like, hey, you want to help me do some work? And then he helped him, and then they filmed it. Yeah, so here's, uh, see. here's the store clerk, and he made a friend here with the kid with autism. Uh, let's see. Put the plug in. Put another one. Put it. Putting away the Tropicana juice. <laughs> You're so good, man. I appreciate that. Where are you from, man? Well, I'm, I'm from here. Where you go to school? Oh, I graduated two years ago. I'm trying to get back into school now. All right, so. That's cool, man. Yeah. And then he's, he also talks about it here because he gained so much attention. Some news outlets rolled over there to talk to him about it. It's kind of weird that, like, shit like this is going by. You know what I mean? Like, it's like a human being is treating another human being like a human being. This is really <laughs> awesome. You know what I mean? Like, there are good people in the world. Yeah, I guess it's good to, it's a nice reminder that everything's not all doom and gloom. But don't you feel like more of this shit, this type of shit happened? Like, it just doesn't get filmed. Yeah. I remember when Rain Man came out, there was like this one autistic kid in the neighborhood, and I tried to play with him because I thought he would be able to be like Rain Man because I was young and dumb, you know what I mean? And then the mom just chased me away. She was like, don't play with him. I was like, all right. I was like, hi, help me understand you. <laughs> By the way, the the grocery store employee, his name is Jordan Taylor, out of Baton Rouge. Right, what, is, what did Jordan say? Right, this is Jordan. If he would have flipped the camera, you would have seen his dad face. It, it said it all. He was just so happy. To me, I've always heard the things that people do when no one's watching is their true character. And you didn't know how many people were going to end up seeing you do that, obviously. You just did out the kindness of your heart. Never pictured all this would happen. I was just being me. 
He's crying. Because he's a nice guy. He's a sensitive kid. Yeah. That's it. I just want to help somebody else out. Enjoy something. Wow. Or get someone else to do your job. <laughs> Made a friend. That's what you want to call it. <laughs> I'm, playing. Oh. <laughs> I'm playing. That's cool. That kid and that and the and the, and the young kid with autism look fucking stoked to be doing that shit. Made his fucking day. Yeah, there kid, you go. That kid's name is Jack Ryan Edwards. There it is. All right, shout out to everybody. It's a feel good story. That's the news. You are checking out the All Out Show with Rude Jude on demand. And that was the show. I want to thank Nomar Slebik. His book is Otherworldly Encounters, Evidence of sight of UFO, UFO Sightings and Abductions. Also, John Sin, the World Series of Poker Champion, stopped in. 2018 champ on the boards Chris on the boards John is a producer and does the news Jet is on the phones Alex the head producer Kenan is the associate producer my name is Jude Anthony Angelini you can follow me at one more Jude we're doing white people Wednesday today it's really good Drake even gave me a fucking photo to post. And Dirt Nasty. Everyone's join everyone's joining in on this shit. That's on my Instagram at one more Jude. Uh and um you can follow the All Out Shows Twitter and IG at All Out Show on everything. We out this bitch. Have a good one, y'all. See you tomorrow.